Thought Leadership from PwC. It's an exciting process. There's a lot of energy in the process. It's a very fun day when you're at the NYSE or the NASDAQ celebrating. On the back of that, you have all your public company that has to take place day two from the organization. That's my guest, Mike Bellin, PwC's US IPO co-leader. This is Heather Horn, and thanks for joining me for the last episode in our Facts on SPACs mini-series. We're ending the series where we started, bringing Mike back onto the show to give us an update on the shifting SPACs landscape. Mike talked about the SPAC life cycle in episode one of this series, and today he's leaving us with a collection of closing thoughts. From the pitfalls to void to the easy wins post the DSPAC process, Mike's telling us what to keep an eye on. And with that, let's get to the wrap up. All right, Mike, thank you so much for coming back to help me wrap up our SPAC series, which has been very popular. And just to kick things off, I thought it'd be helpful to understand, you know, we kicked this off a little over a month ago. And if we've started to see anything different, I've seen some changes in the headlines. So just curious what you're seeing in the market right now with respect to SPACs. Yeah, thanks, Heather. It's, It's good to be back here. From the market perspective, you know, year to date, there's just over 400 SPAC IPOs that have taken place. I think we're looking at about 413 or so as of today, raising about $110 billion in activity. So the SPAC market, you know, if you consider about 320 of those were in the first quarter alone, it's definitely slowed down um, since Q1. I think the Q2 and Q going into Q3 where we sit today, the SPAC IPO market is definitely at a different pace than it was at the end of 2021. And at the beginning of, uh, uh, sorry, the end of 2020 as well. In terms of what we're seeing out there, we're seeing a lot of different sectors still being active in the SPAC space. Fintech, healthcare, industrial products, technology companies are all still part of the, the looking at SPAC transactions. But we're also seeing corporates look at carving out some of their assets, some of their businesses to take them public via a SPAC activity. And then the other thing we're seeing too is once companies are de spacked, we're seeing a lot of those companies acting almost as a platform for the sponsors, for the, for the firm that invested in them, um, almost like a private equity vehicle to go out and acquire different businesses that are out there. So I, I, I think, I think the pace has definitely slowed down, but we're still seeing a lot of creative ways that companies are looking at using the SPAC vehicle, um, not only to go public, but you know, how are they using that vehicle to be public once they're out? So then, Mike, one question I have seen recently, as I mentioned, some headlines of pretty high profile companies you read, they're planning to go public via SPAC, and then maybe subsequently you read they're not going to. Other cases, obviously, we do see that they've moved forward. And so then are you seeing companies that are exploring just regular IPO as an option or companies in those circumstances maybe that are staying private rather than actually going public at this point in time? Great question. I, I think the, the answer is all of the above. We're seeing a lot of companies just explore options out there, whether that's a traditional IPO path, a SPAC, maybe a direct listing if it's the right vehicle for them. But a, a lot of the companies that have been looking at a SPAC merger um, have, have looked at the valuations. They've looked at some of the sponsors behind the SPACs and you know they're being very selective on who they're going out with. So some of the companies that we've been talking to that maybe we're on the journey to go public via SPAC, you know, the summer Q3, I think a lot of those timelines have been pushed back. Uh, I also think that the traditional IPO market is wide open. So if companies do kind of meet the criteria to go public via traditional route, a lot of them are really weighing the benefits of going public via that way. And there's still a lot of capital out there in the private market. So companies that are looking to, maybe go out in 22, 23, 24, weigh their options. There's a lot of private funding that companies are still getting today. Um, as they scale up their operations, they build their operations as they look to go public at some point in the future. So I do think the timelines of many of these companies that are looking to go out is getting extended from where we sat maybe 12 months ago or so. 
And then on a similar note, you gave some interesting statistics on the SPAC numbers. And this is, uh, you're not being forewarned of this question. So if you don't know, it's fine. But off the top of your head, how does this compare to just, I'll call it, quote, regular IPO activity? Way higher, way lower, sort of consistent? I, I think I think in Q2 of this year, we saw a lot more traditional IPOs going out um, than companies de spacking or even SPAC IPOs. So I, I think the traditional route, which has, again, been, been very active in 2020, 2021, it's continued to be very active. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies today uh, looking to get out in 2022 or even 2023, start with their preparation, getting ready, getting the right audits done, making sure that they're hiring the right people and the right roles internally across the organization. But the traditional IPO route, has been extremely active and, and even more so than SPACs uh, for companies to get out and to go public uh, thus far in 2021. So Mike, you actually anticipated one of my questions and started answering it. Are you seeing maybe compared to a year ago or two years ago, a lot more companies just contemplating p- preparing to go public, whether it's through a SPAC or otherwise? So you mentioned these companies looking ahead a year or two you know, again, if, well, maybe a year ago, is not fair because that was the middle of COVID, but two or right at the beginning of COVID, but two years ago, how does today compare to two years ago in terms of companies looking to go public? Yeah, I, I think the companies that go public, the smoothest, the most efficiently, the less hiccups, the less roadblocks are those companies that prepare. And whether that's a SPAC exit, whether it's a traditional IPO exit or other, it's that preparation that really sets them apart from other companies. And we always tell companies 12 to 18 months before you start your IPO or your SPAC process is the best time to really think about getting all that scale in place, getting the people in place, the processes in place, the systems in place to go public, regardless of the way you get there. So we're seeing a lot of companies today um, that may be going out with their traditional IPO, with their SPAC exits. And they've been prepping for this for 12, 18, 24 months or longer. So they're in a really good spot. So when the window's open, they can hit it. We're also seeing a lot of companies start their preparation just now so they can go out later in 22 or 23 and make sure that they have kind of their their infrastructure set up for success as a public company. I, I think I, I don't want anyone to us underestimate the amount of time, energy, resources that it takes to get a company um, ready to be public. So once you flip the switch and you go from private state to public state, you're ready to report your earnings, hit your earnings. Um, you have sufficient people in there to get the reports out that you have to get. You're thinking about socks. You're thinking about what are the right, what's the right governance set up for me as a public company. That all takes time. So a lot of folks that have started that months, years ago are getting out today. Companies that are just kicking that off are looking to get out probably in 22 or 23. Well, after listening to the rest of our series, which hopefully our listeners did, they would definitely appreciate the amount of work that goes into it. And I think, you know, we had some topic specific ones, but then a general one of all of the differences between private and public company reporting. And I think listening to that alone is going to convince someone that they need to make sure they have enough time Absolutely. to get ready. So then Mike, maybe going back to the broader market, if you look into your crystal ball, you know, you said you've seen the slowdown in Q2, but you also said you're seeing companies prepare looking mm-hmm. ahead to next year. So any predictions for what we can expect to see maybe into the fourth quarter of this year and, and next year? Great, great question. I, I think we saw, again, over 300 SPACs go public in the first quarter of 2021, and we saw about 250 SPACs go public in 2020. The average life of these SPACs is, is two years. And when you look at the population as of today, the vast majority of SPACs still have over a year, many over a year and a half left of their life cycle to go out and get a deal done. So what does that mean for me? It means there's a lot of dollars sitting on the sideline, sitting with these SPACs, sitting with the sponsors that is ready to be put to work. So I do think the Q4 of this year rolling into 2022 is going to be an extremely active period for SPACs, for target companies looking to go public via SPAC. There's a lot of capital out there. 
Um, again, I think it comes down to the preparation. Are these target companies ready to go out and be public? Um, and from the matchmaking that takes place between the SPAC itself and the target company, you know, is it the right match? Is it the right sector? Is it the right industry? Is it the right executives on each side of the table that are coming together to get this done? So I, I really think we're going to see an increased amount of activity because there's a lot of pent up dollars um, and a ticking timeline for these SPACs that are out there today. Well, and I think, you know, you mentioned the fact that some of these companies, these SPACs are doing a de-SPAC transaction and then using that entity to re- acquire more entities, which I'm sure amps the complexity, but also creates just another dimension in the market. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think on the first podcast that we did, we spoke about, you know, several target companies coming together as part of the, the de-SPAC transaction, getting the scale for the market. Um, being the right size from a public company. We're also seeing, as, as I mentioned, a lot of companies that go public via the SPAC being that platform, almost acting like a, a private equity vehicle to go out and acquire different companies that sit in that same space uh, to create synergies, really create value for that public company. So I, so I think a lot of these management teams and a lot of the SPAC management teams that really come together are really looking at how can we grow this business best? How can we really scale this business as a public company? Where do we see synergies out there in the market? And I think the SPAC vehicle is one of the ways that companies are taking advantage of that. And the sponsors are taking advantage of that to get that base, to get that foundation of a really solid target company, get them public, and then go out and looking at just adding up and and, and adding uh, different companies, tucking, tucking acquisitions, et cetera, on the back of that. Well, and Mike, to that point, one of the things that I found interesting in all these other podcasts was the sheer number of things that need to get negotiated in between, no matter whether it's a SPAC and a DSPAC or in the cases of these, as you call it, tuck-in or other acquisitions. And you know, we talked about the accounting, not so much the business side of some of those. So can you just maybe share with the audience a little framework in terms of what some of those items are and how they fit into this broader sort of figuring out how to go public thought. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think from the accounting side, you cover on the previous podcast, there's a lot to think about. When you think about the deal itself, I'll, I'll give a few flavors of what we're seeing out there as, as SPACs and the targets come together. Top of the list, I would say, is valuation. A SPAC merger is different than an IPO in that it's an agreement between two willing parties, the SPAC and the target company, coming together to merge. So those companies kind of come together and agree upon the valuation that is out there. Valuations we've seen in this market over the last few months, over the last quarter or so, being a little bit tighter than what they were uh, nine months ago, 12 months ago. So valuation is a key piece of the equation, um, making sure that the sellers on the target side are really getting what they think is the company's worth. And the SPAC is not overpaying as they come in and do a deal. Remember, the SPAC has to keep the momentum of their public investors and ultimately if they go for a pipe investor, you have to keep them happy with that valuation. So making sure it's a reasonable valuation um, is really key for both sides of the equation. The second, the second part that we're seeing out there is the sponsor equity. You know, the sponsor typically gets about 20% of the SPAC's equity. To really sweeten the deal in some of these, um, we're seeing the sponsor really earn that equity in the sense of creating earnouts where some of those equity instruments only vest if the share price exceeds its target level um, for some period of time. It really shows that the sponsor has skin in the game. And I think we're seeing that more and more often as, as these deals get done. I think we hit on the accounting for some of those in, in the previous podcast. It can be extremely complex as a comp, as an equity, as a liability. There's a lot to think about through those, but we're seeing more and more deals thinking about how do we structure the right earnouts for the SPAC sponsor to really earn those shares. We're also seeing some of those on the seller side where maybe there's a little bit of disagreement around the valuation. Is there something akin to what you see in an earnout in a traditional acquisition where the sellers can earn further shares, further equity on the back of a deal? So there's a lot of creativity around that. Employee incentives. What are the employees of the sellers being given as a part of the deal to, to really motivate them to create a successful public company? 
We're seeing a lot of you know new public plans come into place around ESPP plans, RSU plans, other equity plans as part of the public company. So how do we align the employees and, and their work to the success of the public company? Companies are thinking about what is the right structure there. We're seeing a lot of sponsors put up forward purchase agreements, other backstop agreements where if the shareholders redeem a certain level of, of stock at the end of the deal, um, the sponsor itself is, is voting the confidence and putting additional dollars in to get a deal done. We're seeing both that on the sponsor side. We're seeing some sellers from the private equity side too also put some of these agreements in place where they will further invest in their company if need be to get a deal done. So we're seeing a lot of those agreements being hashed out as part of the deal um, negotiations. And then the, fu- the final part of the equation that I'll, that I'll just talk about a little bit is you know, lockups, registration rights. How quickly after the DSPAC takes place can those who hold equity sell their equity? This goes both for the SPAC sponsor side as well as the target side for some of their major investors. Um, typically, the traditional IPO, the lockups historically have been about six months, 180 days. That was pretty standard in the SPAC world. We've seen some get locked up further, 12 months or so. Uh, again, to show they have skin in the game, to make sure that they show the public that they really are here for the long-term success of the organization. Um, but we're seeing lockups you know, move. Some of these are moving on the longer end, some are on the shorter end. So what is the right for the company? Again, this all comes down to the negotiations and the discussions between the buyer and seller. So I think those are really the the five items that we're seeing out there being a part of every negotiation between a SPAC and the SPAC target. And then, Mike, are there any of those in particular that you've seen where you could say, oh, that is impacting the valuation post sort of SPAC acquisition? Or it's hard to say because there's so many different moving parts. It's hard to say, but but I think those items that really show to the public investors that both parties, the SPAC sponsor as well as the target company, really are in for the long-term success of the newly public company. Those are the ones creating value. So some of the earnouts that I mentioned, you know, if if companies are earning that equity based on success and growth and share appreciation of that company, that's a net positive for the market. Some of the lockup agreements, the longer the lockup terms and the longer, you know, the the buyers, the sellers are staying in the company versus selling as quickly as they can. It gives confidence to the market that they believe in the company. They want to stay longer term in the company. So I, I, we've not we've not done the the science around it, but I do think some of those that really show the long term investment in the public company are those that are creating the long term value for that public company. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Actually, that's what made me think of the question when you're talking about that sort of long-term investment that, again, if I were investing, that's what I'd be interested in. So, all right. So then let's move on because I know we've also seen a lot more companies have completed this DSPAC process and are now dealing with being public. And so as you're helping those companies, what types of themes are you really seeing as issues they're dealing with? And Maybe some surprises, some not, but still things that they have had to work through post, you know, the DSPAC process. Yeah, great, great question. I, I think we'll continue to see a lot of DSPACs take place here in Q3 of 21. A lot of companies started this process early. Maybe their timelines got extended, as we spoke about earlier. Um, so I expect to continue to see a lot of DSPACs happen here in Q3 of 21. For the companies that have DSPAC'd, you're suddenly could become public. So you come from private to public, you know, in relatively short order. And as soon as you become public, you have to abide by the SEC's reporting for the 10 Qs and the 10 Ks. You don't get accommodations in a SPAC like you may in a, your in a traditional IPO where your first quarter is due 45 days, you know, later of the end of the, the balance sheet period or the day you go effective. If you're a SPAC, your 10Q is due 45 days after the quarter end date. So, so a lot of companies, you know, that historically were private never followed that regimen. So this goes back and hits on the readiness that we, that we talked about earlier, but the reporting, whether it's quarterly, whether it's annually for these DSPAC companies, it comes very fast. So do they have the right processes in place, the right systems in place to collect the data to prepare 
their quarterly reports, their annual reports to get their earnings releases done. That is key. A lot of companies that have maybe not put in the right preparation up front are struggling with this. They're, they need more external resources, potentially. It's more costly to get out. But those companies that did the right preparation, that have the right systems in place, the right processes in place, this is not an issue for them. And this is not a surprise for any company going public is the due dates of your Q and the K. But we're still seeing companies get slowed down by that process and bogged down in that process. The, the other big item is new accounting standards. I think most of the companies that have de or gone public via traditional IPO route have adopted uh, the Revenue Recognition Standard 606. One that's really coming up for soon for private companies is ASC 842, the new leasing standard. For most companies going public today, regardless of the path, uh, most companies qualify as an emerging growth companies. And what I've seen is most companies have deferred the adoption of ASC 842 until 1122. 1122 is approaching quickly. It's about three months away from where we're sitting today. <laughs> True. <laughs> and for a lot of companies, this new leasing standard is really impactful. It's a data gathering exercise. It's not only looking at the leases that, you know, say lease on the sheet of paper that you signed. There's a lot of embedded leases out there. So how are companies going through and, and looking at the volume of leases that they may have? Are they getting a new system in place to house these leases, to do the accounting for these leases, the disclosure around these leases? Where do your auditors sit on the review, the audit of those leases? Um, so, so new accounting standards like the new leasing standards, CECLs, CECLs out there, as well as a variety of other standards, those always have to be in the foresight of these, these organizations, the CFO, the accounting team, because they come up quick. And 842 is, is very impactful um, for a lot of those. Sarbanes-Oxley, when you think about SOX for traditional IPO companies, that's usually in your second 10K. The management has to think about 404A, and if they're not an EGC, 404B maybe as well. In the SPAC world, depending on the life cycle of the SPAC, depending on whether or not they put out a form 10K or not, SOX may come earlier for these target companies. Again, I point back to the readiness. Have they prepared for readiness around SOX? Have they done any risk assessments? Have they documented their policies, their procedures? Have they tested those policy procedures? We're seeing about 65% of SPACs go out with a material weakness in their uh, S4 filing. Um, how are they going to remediate those? When are they going to remediate those? So SOX is another big undertaking for any company going public and making sure that you're thinking about that. Um, again, people, process, systems-wise for the organization. And then the last thing, and, and I, I, I kind of scratched my head around this one, but we still see it today, is just readiness from a people perspective, from a human capital perspective. Do they have the right people in the organization in the right spots? Do they have the right people with the right experiences to be a public company? And in today's market, um, the job market's tough. There's a lot of competition out there for the right people. So bringing these people to the table and getting these, recruiting these folks can take a, a, a fair amount of time for the organization. So making sure that they're building up, you know, the infrastructure around uh, the, the accounting function, the finance function, the public company can take a bit more time. So it goes back to readiness and preparing and bringing the organization together. But th those are a handful of the areas that we've seen surprise CFOs, CEOs, um, on the back of a DSPAC process. I think, you know, it's, it's an exciting process. Uh, there's a lot of energy in the process. It's a very fun day when you're at the NYSE or the NASDAQ celebrating. But on the back, you know, it's a milestone at the end of the day. On the back of that, you have all your public company that has to take place um, day two from the organization. Well, Mike's definitely a daunting list when you run through all of those. You know, it's you work with these companies other than perhaps anticipating that you're going to be doing this 18 months from now. Uh, what other advice do you have, especially for a company that is dealing with this having come on suddenly? I think it goes back to the preparation again, regardless of what path you're looking to make an exit. Have you, have you gone through and done a public company readiness? And that's not only in the accounting and financial reporting. Um, area, you've heard me talk about governance and making sure they have the right board and infrastructure around the board from a governance perspective. I hit on SOX. What's the right tax structure for the organization? Have you thought about the compensation plans? 
What about your IT infrastructure? What about your cyber um, infrastructure? And the best path when you think about all those areas and the preparation of all those areas is what does your project management function look like across this preparation? That project management is key to make sure that all of those areas are coming together at the right time. Decisions are being made. Steering committees are being set up to, to govern this process. That project management really makes the success of a, of a going public process. Again, whether it's a SPAC, whether it's a traditional IPO, that project management is key. So you hit you know, your org meeting, you hit your filing requirements, and all that preparation that you've worked on, it doesn't get lost. You're ready to be public if you really manage the process well. So I, I think that public company readiness, the cross-functional approach to readiness is, is really key, along with key project management. And then the other, the other um, easy win I put out there for companies is there have been a lot of companies that have gone public in the last 24 months. There have been a lot of IPOs. There have been a lot of SPACs. Looking at some of your peers out there, looking at their reports, looking at their timelines, looking at their SEC comment letters, looking at what their analysts are saying. There's a lot of data out there in the public market that if you are thinking about taking your company public, that you can gather, that you can maybe plan a little bit better maybe than some of those others. You can prepare for you know, what's important for the analysts, where are the SEC, where's the SEC focusing on in terms of the document. There's a lot of that pre-read that, that CFOs, CEOs can do um, to really manage their process a little bit better. And when they think about articulating their story to the street, looking at, again, what's been well-received by the analysts, by the public markets, and what has maybe not been as well-received out there, and really preparing themselves that way. All right. So then, Mike, we've gone through so much information in this series. So I'm going to give you a, a challenging task, since we're talking about challenging tasks, and try to bring it all together. So if you were going to just leave our listeners with one thought about this entire thing, you know, what advice were you, would you give? Yeah, that, that's a that's a big question, and I, I would I would lead our leave our listeners with preparation, the readiness. You know, regardless of your path, regardless of your timeline, whether it's going out in twelve months, eighteen months, twenty four months, or or maybe sooner, maybe longer. Start thinking about the preparation and, and doing a you know IPO, a public company assessment of where you sit today. Take the results of that assessment, put it together on a Gantt chart, a project plan and really chart your way towards success around it. As you go along the path, I think this series of podcasts have given folks a lot of food for thought around accounting issues, reporting issues, hot button topics by the SEC. So, you know, again, listen, listen to what's out there in the public, look at examples of what's out there in the public, um, get an experienced advisor around the table with you who, have, who has done these before and knows what's around the corner as you go through these I think you know that's really the, the 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 key to success in these types of transactions. All right, well Mike, definitely a lot to think about and I would will say these days in particular it seems like you have a very interesting job. So, thanks again for spending the time with us and thanks for joining me. Thanks Heather, appreciate it. That does it for today. If you've enjoyed our SPAC series, consider sharing your review with us or better yet, tell a friend about the show. Your support helps us grow. And wondering what's coming next? Tune in next week for a short series on current events, from the impact of COVID on the long-term economy to an update on return to work. We've got you covered. And then in October, we'll turn our attention to something that seems to be on everyone's minds these days, ESG reporting. So you never miss an episode of our current events coverage Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast series wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all the latest content, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.